Hello there, everyone, and thank you for joining me at the start of a new campaign in Tier No, the last series of Europe, in which we're playing as Ukraine again. In this campaign, we'll be playing as uh, the UNRA, or trying to get to them, uh, but we're going to talk about them. Ukraine has never been free, not truly, for hundreds of years. The closest our state came to freedom was in 1917. And the brief glimpse of freedom from the Russians, Germans, and despots, the days of Uchrevsky were our finest, and they were now lost in history. And even that has slowly been forgotten. Yuri Horlis has no misunderstanding of what will happen if the revolution is broken on the back of the Bolsheviks and Nazis again, and as it terminated, to ensure such a thing never happens again. Should the Republicans win, freedom will return to Ukraine, only time will tell how it is preserved. You will follow the story of the Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army. Is happiness only an eternal, unimaginable mirage? Of course it is. We'll go in favor of these guys to get become democratic, and in the next campaign after this, we'll probably go with the uh, Banderite flavor. The new Huchivsky. Which I'm probably saying exactly wrong. Once for a pure brief moment in time, Ukraine was breathing free. There were no tyrants with a boot against their neck. There were no Bolsheviks or fascists bleeding as dry. And for a very brief moment, there was peace. This peace. There's eternal justification of our being. This monument to the Ukrainian dream was started by the greatest hero the nation, the national revolution, had ever seen since that day. Mikhail Khrushchevsky, one of the few historians of the Ukrainian history of the time, since his election to the head of the Central Rada in 1917. A dream has long suffered setback after setback. By the time of the 30s, the last dedicated source of Ukrainian autonomy was in Polish Galicia, with nothing more than the niche political party of the UDNO. UNDO. <coughs> Excuse me, once the Bolsheviks invaded Poland. All seemed lost. The Soviets found themselves employing local collaborative elements. The UD UNDO among them. As soon as the Germans crossed the border, and the UNDO took the opportunity to rise up. Since those days we fought against all occupiers of the Ukraine and have not given up since. They're the bloody Germans, mad banderites, or a darn communist think we won't have it in us to keep going, then they're wrong, dead wrong. So now, now that we've got political power, and I actually did some actions here to make sure that the grain uh, required by Germany goes up, we've got 75 political power, very good. I don't really want to hurt ourselves here, really. It makes no sense for us to hurt ourselves. Um, uh, more population, let's say growth. Um, really, it's a resistance that we really care about the most. We have no influence. Wow, that's already a lot. 48% over here. And I knew they had a lot, but still. 22, 17, Zitomir. Well, we have the most here. Let's start over here. Raid supplies. Cost a lot of command power. Strengthen friendly networks. I'm okay with that. Oh, the Korean Red Army. Interesting. But then the old guard of the Republic. <clears throat> the culturalists might. Ooh, popular support for the revolution goes up. Partisan support for the revolution goes down. Collaborative support for the revolution goes down. Interesting. Our men on the inside. Ooh. I don't want to hurt our admin efficiency right now, though. Uh, what do we want here first? Ah, let's go to the culturalists' might. For all their heinous crimes, the greatest tragedy of the Ukraine's occupation was the suppression and persecution of Ukraine culture. Ivan Dziba and the culturalists treat this as an existential threat that it is, connecting the root nationalism to the very shared culture and adopting it every turn for resources to be spent on its spread. Growing in influence, they have a simple yet very powerful message, and work to build grassroots support among the people. Though, of course, operating in a decentralized manner, they have proven extremely effective in organizing the militias that will be needed in the fights to come. Um, partisan activity skyrockets. If you want to do that, please go right ahead. <coughs> ah, who needs stability? Usually, uh, the Yark Commissary I kept Sean drunk and Oloblen far away from each other. Oloblen is a mayor of Brest. Oh, I've read this one before. If you want to buy a marriage request too, please go ahead too. Or I'm going to fight for it anyways. Deaths, it's not looking good. you got time. Ceiling spending? Cut that. But then again, this type of Ukraine is not going to survive for very long, if we have anything to say about it. I've already maxed out our consumer, needed consumer goods, which is very good. Um, poverty's not doing very well, but we do have what here? We have a uh, new month, June. Fantastic. Breadbasket of the Rock, of course. Actually, from what is this one from? From government control, desolation, the communist resurgence. Uh, land of contrast, if you want to about that, please go ahead. As well as you want to read about the communist resurgence, please go ahead as well. Paris Flame. Fantastic. Ukraine is doomed. So now the Reds definitely have that under control. Holy crap. Yeah, we're going to start here and get as much support as possible. And then we're going to move over here. And then maybe we'll move up here. Or maybe even keep itself. Because it actually has a slight, slight amount for us. Freedom sleeping through the cracks. It's taken about a couple of hectic days for the UNRA leadership to assemble at an undisclosed location in rural West Ukraine after the cock bombing. 
gathered around a large table in a dimly lit tent. The men here haven't been seeing each other, haven't been in each other's presence at all, almost in a decade. At the end of the table stood Horless, preparing to announce what many were speculating to be the response to the bombing. You see him? A commander sitting across whispers to his compatriot next to him. Horless hasn't looked at his confidence since the West Russian War. Shh, he's speaking. All train eyes on the old Polisian. While we've all been well aware of, he gives a solemn sigh, an experience of decryptness and rot that has festered and grown amid the occupation and the events have unfolded as of late has shown the processes, a smirk or two forms in the room, more advanced than anticipated. Horless's demeanor rises. This bombing represents an opportunity, the likes of which hasn't graced us since 1956. Looking around, he sees, hope in the eyes of his sub-commanders, and since, uh, a pride not since felt the days of the original Republic, an insurrection <clears throat> is coming, and based on what information I can gather from Germany, it'll be sooner rather than later. We will not be caught unprepared this time. We will embark on an accelerated campaign of recruitment, stockpiling weapons, and contacting ourselves across Ukraine with the opportunity the future holds, Horless leans against the table. We can finally liberate our people from all oppression, be it communist, bandit, or a Nazi. An applause rings through the forest. Let's get to work. No pledge to the revolution. <clears throat> Ukraine has not seen freedom for nearly half a century, but the dream of Ukrainian freedom lives on in the broad coalition of the Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army. In its rank stands a diverse set of groups, diehard partisans, almost socialist populists, and even fascistic collaborators, all united under one banner. These pillars of a revolution have their limits of what they are willing to contribute to the cause, represented by the support. If a pillar is more than 50% support, then we'll be granted bonuses, and should have less than 50%, we'll get malices. One pillar's favor comes to the cost of the others, however, and high support for one pillar will see the support of the others decrease. If we are free Ukraine, this pivotal to manage this carefully balanced set. Partisans, the core of the UNRA, the men who fight and die for Ukraine's liberty from fascism and communism. They're some of the most devoted supporters of the anti-fascist struggle for national liberation and seek to cooperate with the Polish Home Army against fascist threats, however. Their fierce anti-communism alienates many leftist populists, and their opposition to collaboration makes the collaborators uneasy. Oh, look at that. More attack and defense, organization recovery rate, daily progressivism support. Populists. Their masses stand beyond the UNRA, whose dream of a freer future where the Ukrainian people are no longer victims of terror and can live in peace. The appeal to the populace, especially the rural peasantry, can form a growing culturalist movement <coughs> for Ukraine's renewal following the liberation. <clears throat> Yet, for their leftist ideology and sympathy towards communist elements, leaves the partisans and collaborators weary. I apologize for my uh, lack of uh, my speaking. Collaborator. There are the current and former collaborators who assist the UNRA. Uh, the policemen, mayors, and small time officials within the UNC who see the current state of the Reichs Commissariat as unacceptable. They are a diverse group, fascists, nationalists, opportunists, all find a home within the collaborators, but their collaboration of fascistic elements make the partisans and populists deeply concerned. For what worse fate could befall a free Ukraine than fascist revel restoration? Collaborators support. Ooh, you lose weekly manpower, political gain, paternalism, fascism support. Oh, God. Rally Borovetsmen. Huh. Emphasize the anti-German struggle. Contact the home army. When removed, popular, popular support goes down, partisan support goes up. Promote dedicated partisans. Ukrainian national UNRNA control of Volin goes way down. Whoa. I don't like that one. Definitely not. Combat internal fascism. Collaborative support goes way down. Mobilize the population. Partisan popular support goes down. Oh, that's not bad. I don't want to lose too much support, but you lose 5% popular support, but you get more partisan support and more Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army control. Defend Ukrainian culture. Popular support goes up, which I do like. And you get more stability when we uh, come out. Offer a nationalist alternative. Popular support goes up. Expand Ukrainian literature club meetings. More popular support as well. Meet with moderate socialists. Interesting. Promise business owners autonomy. Interesting. So collaborative goes up, partisan you lose, populist you lose, increase local reserves. I kind of like that one. Convert police officers, collaborators for the revolution go up. I do like getting more money, but we don't need more money right now. Uh, and then divert collaborator funds. Oh, money goes down, increase local reserves. Yeah, that's not good enough. Um, I want to increase collaborators so we don't get penalized. I want to see what happens. So let's say, so right now we get negative point one five, and you lose weekly manpower and whatnot. So what happens when you increase it? Now, how many more days left? We have 10 more days. So on the 19th, we will have to come back. Uh, Top of support for the revolution. Oh, poverty begins to slowly improve. As well as... Oh, that's, not, that's pretty nice. The slave book clubs. 
A nation's culture is its soul, the Nazis knew as well, in their attempts to stomp out a nation under their iron heel, they've sought to deny their slaves access to the culture, the very souls, their identities, Ukrainians, and as human beings. We reject their tyranny. We'll infiltrate the slave camps and slums across Ukraine, spreading food, protection, and compassion and books. Books are the key to culture, to civilization itself. To deny man literacy is to lock off a part of his mind and doom him to ignorance. So we'll help educate the slaves of the Reich so that one day when they are free, they can express themselves and take pride in who they are. The Ukrainian Hydra. For decades, the primary threat to the state from the Ukrainian Republicans was the UPA, the dedication, extremism, and absolute hatred for our administration ensured that despite their status as banished, they were a dangerous and enduring foe. Recent Republican attacks, however, have increased, incre increasingly originated from other smaller organizations. This organization of both Borovitz and Harlots has exploded in size and capability, missed by the security services, and should be considered just as or even more dangerous than the UPA itself. What's worse, they've proven surprisingly well equipped having acquired or otherwise stolen German equipment from an unknown source. We well, may us be ready to engage them at a moment's notice. The one reprieve we have been granted is an apparent disunity between them and the UPA at large, with reports of intense discrimination between them at multiple locations. This divides their efforts, blunts their effectiveness, and saps their respective strengths. Must take advantage of this? We're able. There is no end to them. Good. Outerborn Nightmare. Um, this is about uh, the Ukrainian insurgent army. So if you wonder about this, please go ahead. They were only waiting. Because I only want to read stuff that really affects us a whole bunch. So. You only need a lot of command power here. We only get 0.79 every day. Are we losing some every week? No. Cool. No updates. If you want to read about no updates, please go right ahead too. Pietro cannot stay with cock forever. Nice. Oh, do we actually lose stuff there? Or we get this up? 42%. Now we're the dominant group here. Beautiful. Yeah, no, Ukrainian insurgent army, you are not going to be leading us here. We're definitely need more, com more command power. I like how strong the partisans are. That, that's very good for us. We, we're going to need to keep that. Yeah. Progressivism. Kruger. Parlous. A young hero. If you remember this, please go ahead. So we started hatching a plan. Promote popular participation. Participation in our struggle against tyranny is broad-reaching, yet some struggle to understand what truly it is. What is democracy if not uh, the participation of the common people in governance of the nation, in resistance to fascism, in solidarity with our country folk? To liberate ourselves, we the common masses of the free people must work together for something greater. An idea with merit for ourselves and the Republic. Yet we also fight for the liberation of not just ourselves, but for our friends, family, and even complete strangers. Should we shirk in our duties? We should miss even one Ukrainian. All this would be not worth it. The people must know that without their help, they and the ones next to them cannot in any sense work the word be free. If you want to read about uh, chaos near my life, please go ahead too. For the sake of the rocks coming through, we hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, we'll see. I want to make sure that this is definitely under us. So, looking for the past. Yeah, if you read that too, please go ahead. Happy August, everybody. We have a cup of tea. Well, we actually, almost finished a cup of coffee here. And now we have a finished cup of coffee. Sad, I know. This will be done in 17 days, about the 18th-ish. Nice. Very, very good. I'm not even going to bother putting people here. Economy. Eh, it doesn't really matter too much, in all honesty. 1.27 is not bad. Oh, so now we have 62%. Less attack and whatnot. More progressivism support. Papa's support went up. Interesting. More stability, war support. Daily social support. And, oh, collaborative went down. Wait, what? We lose more political power, weekly manpower. Journalism. Wait. Oh, pillars decay. If not completed. The other pillars are frustrated with the fervor of the partisans and will decay further. The other pillars are frustrated with the fervor of the partisans and will decay even further. Oh, God. Things are just going down really fast then. So 30 days. What is that one next? A children's story. Now, if you don't know about a children's story, please go ahead. Well, yet the lesson never felt so right. And as well as the questions to the unknown. Interesting. Galician roots of the Ukrainian three. Band the right files. Black Knights. The Battle of Zitomir. Well, if you don't know about this Battle of Zitomir, please go right ahead. The best natural ones were their little to no natural light. Oh. 
These nights only occurred when the moon was dark or clouds covered it. How they had learned to watch for such nights when they happened and take advantage of them. They didn't know when the next one would come. She remembered concern and fear she felt the first time she snuck out. Not for herself, but what might happen if Daniel woke up and feared the worst. Fortunately, he was a heavy sleeper and she was less nervous when she slipped away into the night now. Not that she was gone for very long. The pack she clutched tightly wasn't large. Most of the canned goods she hid away over the course of a couple weeks along with a few loaves of bread. It wasn't much, but she knew the local resistance needed every little bit of it. She knew she was the only one who was giving them such packages either. All of them needed to do their part, herself included. She kept in the shadows. Keeping a keen ear in the case she heard any cars or German patrols, eventually she turned into a small alleyway where one of the parsons was waiting, a young boy who knew to meet her when the moon was dark. She didn't know his name, she didn't ask, she didn't want to know more. All she did was hand him the package and she quickly took, giving her a quick, quiet but heartfelt thank you. They quickly slipped away, she did the same, didn't let her guard down until she was back in bed with her husband. Her sleep afterwards was always better, as she knew some more packages like hers were being delivered across the city. She was glad that the resistance would last just a little longer because of her hope. Liberation would come with we'll donation at a time, of course. I want this overwhelming for us here. Remember who we are. The night was quiet enough that one could almost hear the hushed whispers of the group of Ukrainian slaves gathered in the dingy housing built on a German farm. Really, it was closer to a barn. With its corners poorly lit, its walls cracked wood, and its 40-year-old coat of paint long since peeled and bleached. Despite the dismal conditions, the men and women gathered bore cautious smiles on the gaunt faces, sitting on the dirt around a light and staring intently at their own. The sallow light of the lantern highlighted their hollow cheeks with a dramatic sh shadow, so... What have you got for this week, Olitsky? Asked one man, rubbing his hands together. Our benefactor has been kind, said Olitsky. A man with a graying beard and tired bones, laying out a set of books and scrap paper. The library in town just got ready for carrying Ukrainian literature. So they all dumped what they could in a field. Our good man, Mietka, just scooped it up and brought it here. Spare the details, who do we have? Olitsky began parsing through the books as the other slaves laid into them, although rather than read it on their own, they seemed to have partnered off. Let's see. Shevchenko Stus Odd. Ah, Olitsky paused, pulling a crumpled piece of paper from between the pages of one book. I don't think I've ever heard of this post. Poet. Daniel Nosenko? The ink letters on the yellow pages were faded, and the poem had to be at least a decade old. The verses spoke of the imprisonment of Ukraine and of the author. One man shrugged and tossed at him. They settled in and began to read to one another from the forbidden books of a dying culture which drew breath every, with every line uttered. Tomorrow they would be slaves, but the night they were Ukrainians, and the next night they would be again. The old guard of the Republic. Well, many of our men continue to fight for the Ukrainian democracy. There are very few which continue to shine as brightly as the old guard of the Republic. Uh, Taras Bolba Borovets, a partisan at heart, Alexander Odovyenko, a general who bore the burden of exile, and Yuri Tyotunyak, a man who once supported the Soviets. Their histories are all filled with hardship and struggle, yet they were all in service to the Republic and our homeland. Each of these three men may be old, although they remain eager and willing to fight for the survival and liberation of democracy and people. They all assist us into the best of their abilities, and once the time comes, they will be instrumental in the destruction of the fascist tyrants. If you wonder about a Patriot's resolution, please go ahead. He had to be free. You lose a lot of support here. We can go pop. So probably go to partisans. I'm just seeing this because this is just so low. It's hurting us so much. Eastward flight. Oh, if you know about this, please go ahead. Nice. If anything, we'll probably not go with the populace. We'll probably go with the partisans. Progressivism. Because we still got a while here, so. Sixty-one percent is it's decent. But I want like at least 80%. Happy September, everybody. Fate of Beauty. Uh, you wonder about uh, this? I think there was this one before as well. If you wonder about the Fate of Beauty, please go ahead. I guess getting try to get the collaborative stuff is a waste of time, though. There you go. That'll do for now. Coming home, Artyom shrugged, shuddered. A sir bear coat wasn't doing much to keep out the cold winds drifting through the small town like howling ghosts. The holes in his boots uh, imbibed the mud and melting snow inside them with every step, dirtying his socks and freezing his feet that were already blistered by a day's work. The chill brought his hands a stinging numbness that caused him to struggle, producing his keys as he hobbled towards his apartment. The crumbling hulk of bricks held together by aging mortar and faith shone out like a beacon to Artyom's tired eyes. It did, however, look different since the last time we had been there, about 14 hours ago, more colorful. But some kind of mural scrawled across us. He took on a quicker pace to have a look, taking note of his neighbor assessing it as well. The frail old woman squinted behind her spectacles. At the words on the wall in simple blue and yellow paint, Artyom read it out loud. 
UNRA, fight for your voice, fight for your home and your life, said Artyom, a bit wordy for graffiti, he figured. Hmm, rubble rousers are going to get us all killed, said the woman. Artyom gave a brief glare. Noting a stack of leaflets nearby, he turned back to the horizon and saw a German armored car. Its silhouette wreathed the flame where once farm trucks had peacefully rolled. He heard the crack of rifles in the woods beyond the fields as a war raged in silence where once was tweeting birds. It smelled the putrid scent of the chemical plant submissions where once there was a smoke of heart hearth. He felt the cold bite his skin and a sink its teeth into his bones. Where once there was strength, he took a second glance at the leaflets and waited for the woman to hobble inside. Then he took one. Return of monuments. Oh, Stitch of the Polician Siege. Oh, man on the inside. That's not bad. A reconquest. Saturday Night Mass. Recontest Galicia. Our main base is Port Lazen Galicia. While the Ukrainians are there to receive better treatment than the Poles, they know that it's a farce to pit them against the brothers in bondage. Enslavement is still enslavement, and freedom is still freedom no matter how, where the slavers say. We are glad our people see this. Not only that, but it roots also lie here. It was a Galicia where the UNDO was born, and proud defenders of Ukrainian rights under Polish rule on the Soviet occupation. When proclaimed Ukrainians liberation from fascist tyranny, a beautiful tree was brought, and its roots will be in Galicia, the birthplace of a new Ukrainian democracy. Its fruits shall be grant being granted to all under its shade. Heirs of the Exile Exile is something many Ukrainians know of intimately. When the Bolsheviks first came, those who resisted were forced to leave their homes and become emigres. Exiles in a foreign land, surviving until their time to return home. And while they settled into their new homes and went about their new lives, none have ever forgotten about their homeland. But most remain in their houses, watching from afar as their land is butchered. Some return to their ancestral homes. Side by side, they stand in solidarity with us, marching with us, fighting with us, bleeding with us. They give the Republic the legitimacy of the true government of the Ukraine that it so desperately needs, and they give us something which the people need in these trying times. Hope. Our men on the inside. There are many brave souls in Ukraine who have accepted the ire of the countrymen in order to collaborate with the occupation and thereby infiltrate it. Among these stand Oloblim. Former the, formerly the mayor of Kiev and now serving as the mayor of Brest following that forced relocation by cock. Although saddled with Bahezi, the fascist, as his deputy, both now and then, he's been able to keep the man in check and thereby maintain his position. A most useful position in formation, supply, and weaponry can be and is directed to liberating forces, moving the state ever closer to freedom. A new shipment of both is immediately forthcoming. Ah, good. We got most of the stuff done here. It's 1962, so we still got some time before we really need to improve a lot of other things that we have here. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. And where are we at with this? Good raid. So we're at 72%. We're going to keep it there. That's pretty good overall. Um, and so we're going to start working on Zhidomir. That would be very nice. Uh, or Recontest Galicia. And that the westernmost extreme of Ukraine lies Galicia, a region stuck in a rather complicated situation. Currently, it lies under the jurisdiction of the general government, separated from Germany's administration in Ukraine. Despite this, much of our popular support comes from this region, regardless of the arbitrary lines that Germans have dined to draw across Eastern Europe. Unfortunately, our mortal enemies, the Ukrainian insurgent army, have also considered sway over the, considerable sway over the people of Galicia. We cannot allow them to regain our monopoly over one of the few regions we can call our own. Coordinating efforts to combat their influence will be rather difficult in such a distant area, but the alternative may cost us our only reliable base of support. Flem, flem, flame, lead, and grief. I think I've read this one before as well. Huh. So if you want to read this one, please go ahead. Death of Queen Wilhelmina. Unfortunate. But she had to go. Uh, actually, you know what? They don't, they don't have enough support here yet, so we're going to wait to do recontest. Maybe we'll prying open the pipeline would be best. <clears throat> Next. Happy December. Uh, for those in the Arx Commissar at Muscovy, buying guns is a surprisingly easy affair. A steady stream of illicit weapons pour out of Germany daily and be siphoned by their various factions and used to conduct their endless war, until now the PG. I support itself through less reliable methods of raiding desertion, but that can change, with our connections to Oloblin. We may be able to divert this pipeline for our own ends. Each German gun will leave us more prepared for the upcoming war, and perhaps time, in time, perhaps more than the Germans themselves. Soup and subterfuge. The meat the roll shifted in the seat. Uh, the bar stool. Uh, tilting onto the short leg with its weight and then back onto its more stable side, you're sweating through his clothes, burning hot with the searing glares of the bar patrons, uh, tired Ukrainian workers who didn't want to see his face. But they knew he, who, what he was, even without his uniform. What can I get for you, officer? asked the bartender, lazily working away at a silver stain on the counter with a wet rag. Just as practice, he said, I'll have the soup. The bartender blinked, then after a moment responded, We don't serve soup. I'll check the back. 
Dimitri Rolin nodded as the bartender tucked the rag into his apron and entered the back of the ape house. Returning to the portly older man, he took Dimitri aside in a relatively remote corner of the bar. I take it our mutual friend O.O. sent you, he asked. Yes, before you ask, I wasn't following. The other policemen drink at a bar across town. They'd better. Wouldn't want any of them around here. Present company excluded, huh? The man rubbed the back of his head. Right, you have it? Yes. Positions, movements, station defenses. Dimitri produced a folded piece of paper and handed it over. The aging man took it away and smiled. Ukraine thanks you, officer. So, that's not looking good here. I'll go send out to a boost of partisan support at this point. Keeping support high is actually pretty difficult. Partisan. Embolden. Lynn. Riley's men. I don't want to hurt ourselves, but that's not bad to take either. Mm, fine, we'll do that one. Uh, Olo Blin's place in Brest. Olo Blin may have been exiled, demeaned, and forgotten, but that doesn't mean he's powerless. Under his watch is a small collection of minor anti partisan and police brigades, all of which are at least willing to work with us. Some of these men are strident Democrats, striding to protect the people from any further damage. Others are Melnyak, fascists, simply tired of Reich mismanagement. Whatever the motives, we can use them. While not enough for a full division, their map will prove you valuable in our fight against the Nazi menace. 30% is not bad. 73% is decent. So we have until January of uh, uh, about 20th. Say what you will about those turncoats. They sure as heck know what they're doing, said Anatoly with a mad grin. Making sure his rifle's loaded. Haven't been so sure of victory since who knows. He surveyed his UNRA comrades, both those in his full view in the ditch alongside him, as well as that what he could see in his counterparts in the bushes on the opposite side of the road. And his associates wore much grimmer expressions. Kraidolo was shaking visibly, and his face was twisted into a grimace. Olitsky held a cautious smile, but his eyes were framed by black bags. Let's see if his information holds up. Can't trust every darn cop who comes to us with a tip. The brief conversation was interrupted by a rumbling engine. And until he took his rifle in one hand, using the other to pull himself up slightly and get a good look out of the ditch. Beyond the hasty roadblock of heavy bricks, logs, and debris flanked by miles of countryside, a swastika emblazoned truck rolled from exactly the direction they had predicted. The aging vehicle coughed and groaned as it halted, whispered conversations in German took place within. Oletsky was out of the ditch before anyone could, could speak, and once with movement, his feet propelled him up into the road. His fingers pulled three, free the pin of the hand grenade, and his arm sent it through the windshield. The projectile drove two men out, who were fired upon the side of the police uniforms. They went down before the weapon detonated. After the detonating crash, the vehicle's cabin and cargo were pieces, and his passengers de dead. Without a word, the partisans were on to the next move. Thank you, officers. How are we supposed to keep it high? I do not understand. Like, this is just destroying our support here. I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll do our best we can. A bureaucratic reshuffle, huh? Pull some strings. Rally the turncoat coppers. Organize the mobs, call the collaborators. A bureaucratic reshuffle. Fortunately for us, there is a healthy variety of capable, suitably sympathetic bureaucrats who may be inclined to lend their talents to our cause. As fortunately is the fact that most of them languish in useless positions in which their abilities are all but wasted on menial tasks that accomplish little. Meanwhile, Melnick's collaborators have stacked the bench in Brest Litovsk, and if we are to gain a foothold there, we'll need to find a creative solution to this little roadblock. Alexander Oloblin has presented such a solution. He shall begin the process of a bureaucratic reshuffle in Brest Litovsk. And ensure that bureaucrats loyal to us take it all the top spots while making sure that male next men find themselves in the useless offices that our allies once held. Uh, Bahazi's lot won't be too pleased with this maneuver, but we have not come this far without already stepping on a few toes. Germanus' uh, grain was not demand was grain demands were not met. Local grain demands are not met. Ah, oh, resistance status in every region. Ah, oh, very good. All as calculated. But now look over here. Hey, 77% nice, 35%. We've got a small sliver of percentage in every region now. I love it. For us. What percentage is that? 4.5? 4.5, yeah, this is all 4.5, yeah. Cool. The 9%, 82%. Partisan support for the revolution. Paternalism is going down. Progressivism is going up. It's kind of a mess. 
But what else is new? So with this in mind, because Saturday Night Mass is nice and all, but... Honestly, that would make more sense for us to do, but I still want more partisan support no matter what. Rally the turncoats. Boleyn, 9% more. I think that's worth it. If we want to read pull some strings, please go ahead, but... The Germans have long understood that holding the lands of the east with a Wehrmacht alone is an impossible task. Here in Ukraine, many of the local policing duties have fallen into the hands of native police units who collaborate with the occupiers in order to free up their soldiers from oppressing fronts. The Germans maintain a turn us against one another, but this may prove to be their undoing to seize Brest Litovsk. We need to only reach out to the police departments there and sway them to see things from our point of view, as far as we know. The tendrils of the UPA have not managed to penetrate into the local law enforcement, and it would be uh, unwise to sit around and wait for them to seize a chance before we do. Should all go to plan, we'll gain a very useful ally indeed when the uprising begins in earnest, of course. 42% is pretty good. We couldn't do this one because we don't have enough command power, though. Oh, they're lowering our support here already. No, yeah, not good. Borough, that's Commissars, huh? Yeah, might as well. Since the UNDO effectively accused the USSR military government of Galicia, and even further beyond the last days of the Bolshevik invasion, Taras Bolba Borovets has fought for democracy with his armies of supporters for decades on end, while constantly harassed by a disorder within his ranks and arrest from the German forces. Borovets has stood firmly for a cause. Currently occupied and maintaining the Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army within the general government's borders, the living legends found himself wanting for more manpower. With the recent wave of volunteers now waiting in the wings, we have the option to send them towards Borovets for training under his faithful 100-man army, a commissar, so named after those faithful few who stuck with Borovets for so long, given these reinforcements. It won't be long before these skilled men and women find themselves to be part of those legendary 100. The man on the inside, and the shadow of the Reich's stern gaze, Alexander Oloblim, the mayor of Brest, wore a mask of collaboration, his quiet resilience and undercurrent beneath his diplomatic exterior was a well-guarded secret. A subtle act of rebellion had quietly fed the resistance. He could only do so much without suspicion arising, but when word got it to him about the impending uprising, Oloblim put a subversion into high gear. He looked at the city's administrative apparatus, filled with the Reich's loyalists, and he knew that time could for a more daring gambit. With a firm resolve, he called a late-night meeting, the moon hanging high as a silent witness. He gathered Bahizi, and all those in the administration that had silently pledged their loyalty to a free Ukraine, they were as chess pieces in a game of deception. In the following days, Brest witnessed what seemed to be an administrative shuffle. Although Bloom, with a subtle touch, began removing the Reich's pawns. Some were reassigned to insignificant roles. Others were inconveniently transferred. The replacements always ready, their true loyalties hidden behind impassive masks. A German official, swayed by Aldo Blin's charisma and facade of bureaucratic efficiency, suspected little and so, piece by piece. The C's administration was quickly overtaken, a sudden coup unfolding under the Reich's unsuspecting watch. Brest lay in wait for the first signs of rebellion, and when the signal would come, supply lines would be blocked, communications severed, and backs would be stabbed. The liberation of Brest would happen in a court record time. A little bit would make sure of that. A vital first step towards a, a free Ukraine. I don't mind helping out the populists. I don't mind having both support here. 40 political power, support for the revolution. Sure, why not? Why is it so low? My god! It's insane how bad it gets. Like, I don't know if you can actually balance things out correctly, but uh, you know what? We're here to see. 78%, that's pretty decent. 40%, that's not bad. Just want more command power, man. And then we'll do rally the turncoats and call the collaborators. In an ideal world, we would renounce any man who worked to maintain the German hold on our land. However, we do not live in an ideal world. Administrators, bureaucrats, soldiers, we need them all. Our map, our reserves can drastically be improved with the addition of these Ukrainian collaborators, and their knowledge would do wonders fueling our new beast. With every take, we gain information, intelligence, and caches of precious weaponry. Past the moral conundrum, using the vast banks of resources is no brainer. The new shall be spreads. Posters, pamphlets, word of mouth, join the Republic, no matter your crimes, Waffen SS, the National Army of the or the Auxiliary Police, the past makes no more difference. If you wish to fight for the Ukrainian Republic, we welcome you. Passing the torch, uh, hell of a mustard, declared Oleg Jovi to place his hands on the uh, railing eyes, fixing the men running laps out of the field. The abandoned farmhouse was doing nicely as a makeshift partisan compound at large. They have an overgrown plot of land for training exercises, a remote location nestled behind a port forest, plenty of timber, existing material for walls and watchtowers, barns for housing, and a nice big farmhouse from which to operate raw to Dimitrio and his unit. Uh, or Dimitro. Both of us would be proud if he ever got around to touring this place, although it was best it stayed a secret. A compound this size would not go unnoticed. 
One other benefit was the balcony from which Dimitro and Oleg could watch the men. It's much more than I expected, certainly. You had to be almost 60 to our men, to our, what, three training officers? You mean Yakti? I mean, I command whatever superhuman or recruiter got all these folks here, but it'll be a bit rough, said Dimitro. Yeah, I wouldn't worry. Their men are eager, and if ever, even if they are green. We'll get into fighting shape. We, did, we were just like them at their age, weren't we? Just look how we turned out. Oleg grinned at Dimitro, patting the old soldier's back, prompting him to win some contact with an old war wound. Oleg then turned back to the troops. I suppose you're right. Yakiv does have a way with new recruits. He relented Dimitro as he watched Yakiv begin showing the men proper rap handling. We should probably get down there regardless. It's the job of the old men to teach young. We can't let Yakiv have all the fun. A whole new generation of officers. God, we're out of stuff here. Uh, wow, the comments really want more control, huh? They barely have control over there. 73% is fine. I mean, this is technically cheaper to do than this one, but it also destroys uh, infrastructure a little bit. We'll do whatever it takes to get to two tiles under us. Yeah, call the collaborators. Sixty-two percent is pretty good. More stability. Yeah. Return of Monuments Unity. The discord that should otherwise exist between the many men now cooperating in pursuit of a shared goal has astonishingly failed to manifest. And working together, they have managed to make incredible progress in their goals. Though certainly amazing in their own right, this unexpected unity also offers tremendous opportunity to demonstrate national cohesion. This opportunity cannot be missed, and so a campaign of information will be launched. Uh, the bravery and camaraderie existing between these men shall be showcased, and in doing so, the same principles can be attributed to the state. Who needed stability? Oh my god. Trying to do the best we can. You know, I'm gonna wait to do raid supplies. They no longer have full control, which is good, but still. No, it's a but still. Ooh. Eighty-two percent, so very good. Come on, we get point five to every day. God, that sucks. Because the war sport does not exist anymore. Soon. Plenty of political power, though, at least. Ah, there we go. 82%, 52%. 52%. Just beautiful. This will be done when? In 22 days, so near the end of the month. What of the occupiers, General Planos, and its cruel implementation over the past two decades meant that thousands of Germans have moved east to settle on their lands, cleansing it of Ukrainians and fertilizing their lands with their blood. Now there are hundreds of thousands of settlers across the country, many glad followers of the Nazi cause. The question of how to deal with them is debated within our movement. Some consider that trying to deport all the Germans will create a fifth column against the cause, particularly among those that lived in Ukraine prior to the occupation. Others consider that there is no other adequate course of action. Other questions regarding what happens to the children of these settlers had no choice in the matter has also arisen. It would be nearly impossible to make a decision that appeases everyone within the movement. The more collaborative, sympathizing part of our faction wishes to give concessions to the settlers, which will not go down with their more nationalistic followers, yet a decision must be made still if we are to deal with the issue at hand decisively. Let us avoid falling over the first several to create a free Ukraine, crossing the divide. When everyone is pissed off at us, pretty normal. A sunlight stepped into the courtyard. A group of men faded in faded police uniforms stood shivering in the heart of the UNRA camp. They were. Defectors, each man there for his own reason, whatever that be purely for survival or sincere desire to change, whatever it was, they were here now. Commander Andre, a seasoned UNRA partisan, squinted at a motley group through the pale light, his eyes hardened by years of struggle. Held a firm gaze that seemed to penetrate the layers of uncertainty surrounding the new arrivals. You've heard our call, he said, his voice echoing through the silent camp. You've seen the strength of our cause, but to fight alongside us to wear the badge of the UNRA requires a sacrifice. Let us word sink into the men before him. You must renounce your past allegiances. Every action you took to harm the Ukrainian people, denounce fascism, and pledge your loyalty to the democracy. This isn't negotiable. As the words were met with a palpable tension, the defectors looked at each other, visibly uncomfortable, yet one by one they voiced their agreement. I, I renounce fascism. I pledge my support to the democracy. I stuttered a burly man in front row, his eyes fixed on the ground. 
The rest followed suit, their declarations varying in the conviction they carried. Some echoed the pledge firmly that our voices steady, while others looked to the ground and just stumbled on their words. Commander Andre listened to them all, silently measuring the depth of their commitment. He knew that not all of them were sincere. A few more were bound to flee, perhaps even sabotage the uprising from the inside. He would keep his eye on them. As he watched a group of defectors standing before him, he saw a glimmer of potential. There was a risk, but it was one that was necessary. There would be no free Ukraine of everyone with questionable allegations or allegiances were forbade from assisting the cause. Given enough time, the men would represent a valuable asset in the fight against the occupiers. But the Karnati accepted their pledges. Welcome to UNRA, he said with a stern reminder in a stone. Remember, you are now soldiers for democracy. Let your actions reflect that. From fading uniforms to newfound purpose, uh, transformation would soon unfold. Do you think they care about this group right now? You're the group, really? Got bigger things to worry about right now. Well, King Fodok is dead. Oh no, the target. Peter? Uh, I have uh, done this one before, so if you read this one about the target, please go ahead. It miss once more. Of course it did. We're right at 50%. I don't like that. I want more. That's devastating, huh? So we have a sliver, two, two and a half, two and a half, and then four and a half. It isn't bad. Still, I want to play to our strengths. Right now, this is a good strength as well to have. Which the one key make most sense for us? We'll try it. Eight percent bomb. Pretty good. Settlers. Instead of a farmhouse, decisions that could shape the nation's future took place. A vigorous debate flourished in the UNRA's makeshift town hall with only one topic at hand, what to do with the German settlers. The numbers were numerous, but motives varied. The delineation and distinctions rested on the sidelines as the new camps began to form. Such really a matter of discussion, Borovitz's booming voice fell on the floor. Every German who has occupied our land has had a part, a part to play in Ukraine's theft. Their wealth has been harvested with their blood, our blood, extracted from our land. Zubia moved in and took the lead from here. Ukrainian peasants have toiled for lands, our lands for decades, passing from father to son in their natural order only for it to be blighted by foreign newcomers. The crowd cheered as Zubia only grew more fervent. In order to be an independent nation, these centuries of colonialism must be eradicated. The settlers' land will be restored to Ukrainians, the settlers will return to their homeland. Their property here will be void. If they choose to fight, we will play for it in their blood. Vengeful approval roared from the crowd. The painted uh, ideal of their ancestral homes returning to them after so long brought a flood of emotions to the fighters of better times, the comfort of the cold reality outside the farmhouse. Although Blim pushed himself to the stages of voice of dissent, idealism is commendable, but reason must not be cast aside. These settlers have grown to become part of our nation, a backbone of our economy. The crowd remained silent. Uh, any fervor they had carried was smothered by Oloblin's pragmatism. If we reject them, we send them into the arms of the enemy. Therefore, it is necessary to integrate them as citizens if a Ukrainian would be a suitable one. Slowly, voices broke out from the crowds of people made up their minds. The ideas of Borovitz and Zubia won the day. Like, any attempts with negotiating with the Reich in the future harder. But if Borovitz and Zubia, Oloblin's appeals to the common sense were accepted. Make any attempts at negotiating with the Reich in the future easier, benefiting Oloblin. Nope. I gave up on that idea. Organize the mobs. The inevitable grows closer and closer. The instability gripping the occupation state and its loathsome administrators grow stronger and stronger, and more people and more people are emboldened to stand against it. Yet the puppets still have strength, and in time they will crush the bodies and death, a spirit of these brave souls unless we take action. We will, we will organize, arm and task them with a purpose, and in doing so turn them from a mob into an army. They stand a chance, if they stand with us, the invaders have none. Two percent is cutting it pretty close, though. That's why we'll use this one instead. Four percent, three percent, six percent, you know. Don't worry about the economy, it's only crashing and burning. That's when it'll be done near the end of May. Rubies through the rough. If you want to buy this one, please read it too. Perhaps he was lucky after all. At least it's positive for now. Of course, we're going to have a blue water navy. Why would we not?
action and reaction. Olatsky could only feel proud as he walked back to his village. He knew that every German colonist felt the same fear he spent his own life with after the UNRA's recent raids. Crops growing on Ukrainian land being redistributed to starving families. Prized possessions being reclaimed in righteous punishment of the worst uh, brutes. He could only imagine the pain Germania felt from these attacks. But his, his village was quiet. It was never uh, thronged with conversation, but today it felt like he could only hear the flies buzz. Alexei's mood was unabated as he tried to walk uh, with those sparse few lingering outside it, but he could not drag any words from their mouths, giving up their turn to his home. There was no hero's welcome here either, only his mother crying over the kitchen table, creeping slowly to give her comfort. Alexei swore as he felt her recoil as he touched her. Germans came. I don't think they were soldiers. They might as well have been. They carried sickles and hammers, rounding up anyone they thought was a bandit. The rude ankles. Her voice cracked before she buried herself into her arms. They were butchered like animals. Alexei wished for that familiar feeling of fear to return, but only found despair in his absence. He stumbled out of the house and ran, his eyes down to the ground as the hero left his village forever, only hearing his mother scream for him as he ran. Where were you, Alexei? Oh, where were you? Going to the people. The village owner looked out of the dusted window and frowned. A line of armed soldiers had come to the town center. In his long life, he had seen his cycle repeatedly. Soldiers come demanding grain to eat, men to fight, and women to take. For the past year, it was the UPA doing the plundering, protecting their motherland by stripping it bare as, it, as the village's sold was his duty to treat these newcomers. Soon a knock sounded on the door, and a well-dressed young man entered the hall. The salty motions for him to sit, placing a plate of stale bread on the table, the first tribute of the day. The man introduced himself as Ivan Zubel, a representative of the Polician Guard. The salty forced a smile. Our village greets you, sir, but I regret to say that we hardly have enough grain to feed ourselves, nor do we have much in the way of money or weapons. You need not worry about bandits any longer, Zubel replied with a knowing smile. I haven't come to ask anything of you or your people today. Instead, I would like to know what I can do for you. Struggling to contain his annoyance, he snorted. Well, I'd like four suckling pigs and thirty kegs of vodka to start. Then we could talk about repairing Artyom's fence. The young man chuckled. Perhaps I could be arranged in time. Please write down all your concerns, and I'll see that they are at least addressed. I'll be meeting with your villagers in the meantime. When Zubio returned, Zubo, uh, he was met with a long list of demands and concerns, most reasonable and nearly identical to a dozen other villages, except for one Russian alien. Squatting on land, must leave, he read. His lips pursed. The other requests would not be actionable in the short term, but this nuisance, something could be done about him. Gotta make sure to keep our support here. Eight percent. What are you going to start if we possibly can? Our support's pretty decent already. Nice. And we have the political power, so we might as well spend it. I don't want the thing lasting for too long, so. And we can do this one in twenty-six days. Organize the mobs. Safeguard of liberty. Admin efficiency will go up. The Nazi abomination is falling apart. Their authority in the west of Ukraine has become little more than a formality, with a central occupation force unable to extend their control outside certain urban areas. It's finally time for a partisan movement to prepare to take up the reins of government. A provisional will be formed to quickly take the place of the Reich's Commissariat. A democratic liberal republic, not communist and not fascistic. Horrorless and ill men. Not ill men, but loyal men will take the helm and create a proper system that serves the people and will listen to their demands. Transition will be difficult. Our country has been stripped of much of its resources. A few have had their opportunity to govern themselves, but let this be a step towards prosperity for all Ukrainians. A dream much closer to being realized than it may have ever been. Way to consequences. At the last vestiges of resistance fell away, an unsettling calm descended upon the plantation. The mob surrounded the body that once belonged to its German owner, which lay lifeless on the mansion's uh, grand staircase. As a aristocratic demeanor extinguished under the mob's wrath, the mob triumphed but directionless, meandered through the mansion and fled the vast and the vast fields surrounding it. A sense of discomfort spread among them. They had won, but what were they to do now? The wrath of the Reich was as sure as the sunrise. Stories of brutal reprisals in response to such acts of defiance were common. Whole villages were raised, families torn apart, and indiscriminate executions. The Reich's contribution was legendary in its brutality. As this realization, realization settled, the mansion's grandeur took on a more sinister appearance. Every shadow seemed to hide a German soldier. Every gust of wind carried the echo of marching boots, and every moment of silence was counted to, to was a countdown to their impending doom. Others started murmuring about escape, their voices laced with fear. Others suggested a last stand, their determination wavering but not yet extinguished. A third faction yet thought of reaching out to the UNRA for aid. Amid the chaos of these discussions, the plantation loomed over them all, a silent testament to their action and a seemingly imminent bloody consequence. The living threat of the Reich hung over them like a storm cloud, the calm before a tempest of violence and retribution. They knew the storm would break down by day, or by break, break by dawn, and they could only hope to weather it. And then the Banderite files, defeating the Ukrainian insurgent army in Galicia will be no small task. These eventual Banderites are fanatics and have always been known to fight with an almost animalistic ferocity. 
That being said, radical ideals are no longer a substitute for proper tracks or tactics, and I think, with the help of a little, with a little creative thinking, supplanting them as a dominant partisan group in the region may indeed be possible. Our initial strategy shall be to remain a step ahead uh, of the Banderites at all times. Protestant units shall observe the patrols, examine the effects of their ambushes, and study which avenues of attack they are almost, most comfortable with. Once we have this knowledge in our arsenal, we shall use it against them and root out the UPA once for all. So we can do that one, but I don't save up for this one too, so. I want more of a lead here. One single spark. If you want to do this one, please go ahead. Oh man, they lost it here, huh? 8%'s not bad. Safeguard liberty. Civilized men do not rely on force of arms to maintain order. Coercion and oppression are the methods of animals. Creatures who fight among themselves to establish dominion over their kin. That's not the way Ukraine must develop if it wishes to endure. A fact not long lost in the democratic leaders who claim to represent the future of the nation. Horlis, Borovitz, Zubia, and Olobin have all been gathering for the past week to develop a provisional constitution for their hopeful republic, a task that while challenging promises to create a unified and united government held together by trust and respect. During the long sessions, the old constitution of the 1917 People's Republic had been invoked often, each time bringing an air of purpose and pride to the discussion. The will of the Ukrainian people has always been thus, a democratic and free nation that is capable of standing, against strong, standing strong against foreign imperialism and corruption. Memories of the past rarely calash with its uncountable cruelties in the short-lived state are achieved more acclaim than it probably should, yet still the dream persists. Provisions and articles are carefully crafted, laying out the basis for elections and rights. The framework for judicial, legislative, and executive bodies are provided, as well as their individual limitations and checks. Most importantly, separation of powers is laid out as indisputably necessary. No military uniform personnel will be permitted to hold office or run for elections. No dictators will be allowed to remove term limits or usurp the courts. The foundation of the Republic will be a strong constitution forged by the founders and empowered by the forefathers who fought for Ukraine over generations. And the nation will be built up from its built it but the nation will be built up from it by the will of the people. I want a solid lead here, sixty four percent is very good. Two thirds. Two thirds is really the the golden one that I like. What do we got here? Twenty days, july twenty fifth? Nice. Hey, that's good. That's not bad. Get more stability too. Strength in numbers. Um, they barricaded themselves inside the mansion, shoving priceless furniture up against the doors, wielding kitchen knives and meat cleavers. The night was sleepless and tense, but as the first rays of the dawn broke, the soldiers that came for them were not Germans at all. With dozens of pairs of eyes watching them from the mansion, the soldiers conferred outside in the fields and sent one man forward carrying a white flag inside the mountain uh, mansion. Hands clenched over weapons, but nobody made a move. We are not your enemies, the man shouted. In Ukraine, as he walked up to the front door, we are the culturalists. Our cause is yours. All of you in there have spent years working for nothing on this plantation, back-breaking labor for the oppressors. Unrewarded, you have shown your spirit, your humanity, by taking over this place, and the Germans will give you nothing but blood for it. But my friends, we have seen your spirit. Uh, that you and our can always use people like you. Come with us and show the Nazi scum that we are not animals, but men. For a moment, the silence was ear-splitting. The white flag flapped in a slight breeze. Then the front door opened, and the men came in, out into the dawn. We're not here to butcher you. We're here to work together. Oh. Looks like they're still doing this crap here. So I do more of this. And maybe defend the local populace. And then the build of the Polisian siege. The Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army has been driven deep into the Galician Mountains. Despite this, they are still a formidable force, possessing hardened fighters, deep ties into the region, and a willingness to fight and die surpassed, perhaps only by our own. It's therefore time to ensure that our alliance is formalized, politically if not yet quite militarily, and so cements future relations. The Polisian siege is valuable indeed and will benefit from such cooperation in the future. United Front of Three. The three men sat huddled in the back of an old barn, barely sheltered from the old cold Ukrainian night. The air was tense, thick with resentment in the dim light. Um, uh, Vasily the Partisan looked on his new companions with a scowl etched on his rugged face. His eyes fell on Evgeny, a peasant, a newfound UNRA fighter. Vasily scowled as his gaze shifted to the former collaborator, Leonid. Feeling the weight of Vasily's stare, Leonid adjusted his collar nervously. I'm sorry, Vasily. What's your problem? Vasily's gaze was uh, unwavering. You're a weaselly coward, that's a problem. How do I know you're not going to turn tail the moment you feel that my butt is in trouble? I wouldn't be sitting here in a freezing barn with a German scum. Uh, scurrying around if I wasn't committed to the cause now, would I, Vasily? Evgeny cut in gruffly. Enough squabbling. Leonid is regrettably right. As much as I despise him, we don't have the luxury to choose only mor morally upstanding men. Now shut the heck up before someone hears us, you ding-dong. 
Uh, the barn fell silent again, and now it was Vasily's turn to be penetrated by Leonid and Yevgeny's gaze. For it felt like an eternity, the three men sat there. Vasily let out a heavy sigh. The scowl softening as the weight of distrust relented. I understand there are greater things to worry about. The harsh atmosphere lifted, if only slightly. Thank you, Vasily. Yevgeny replied, It is hard for me too, but as much as we don't like it, it is necessary. The three men looked up at each other again, this time not with distrust, but an understanding that settled between them. A fragile bridge built upon the recognition of their shared purpose, and soon that purpose will be tested. I deal with the Reds. Chase the commies out. Well, I don't want to lower our partisan support. Pop support would be nice to get, though. Um, Recontest Galicia. Well, we didn't boost us there. Pull some strings. We rallied the turncoats. Oh, why did I choose this one? Oh, oh we had less partisan support. Um, uh, Ukrainian Orchestra. A deal with the Reds. Well, in all honesty, we can we can probably take that deal. You know, I deal with the Reds. It's impossible to downplay the size. Uh, uh, the upcoming struggle we must surmount for a free Ukraine, savage banderites, the Reich's armies, and zealous Bolsheviks all stand in the opposition to the establishment of democracy in our homeland. We cannot afford to face all three of our enemies at once, and we may not have to, though. Um, as much as we may loathe the Reds, for decades of socialist dictatorship, we share a mutual hatred of the fascists that uh, far away our animosity for each other. Well, these are contacts to send a message to the communists asking for ceasefire, maybe even an agreement for cooperation, to destroy the vile forces of the UPA and the Nazis. It won't last, of course, but one less enemy to deal with in the early phases will give us time to build up and annihilate them later, of course. And more for them, too. And with the band the right files, with the bridge uncrossable. And they're really hammering home here, aren't they? We have a giant fight on our hands here. Even more if we can. As the rain poured down, Sergeant Chornoliv led his soldiers into the town of Kroyutka. The uniforms and boots thoroughly soaked. They. Had to use the adverse weather to ambush a camp of UPA outside the town, the attack had been a rousing success. Most of the defenders were slaughtered before they could pick up a gun, and the rest were shot as they tried to flee for reinforcements. The victory had been so complete that the soldiers paraded into town like victorious conquerors in a column with their heads held high. When the soldiers first began to enter Kraivka, uh, there were only a few civilians out on the street. Some of them appeared confused at their presence, a few others took off their hats, and the rest just stared in shock. They must have never believed that they would be liberated. The sergeant amused himself with a subtle grin. As the troops marched deeper in the city, more civilians came out of their homes to watch the spectacle. The sergeant noticed the mother hurting her kids inside before slamming the door shut while another few civilians sobbed at their approach. The column advanced. It was stopped by an elderly man in a tattered military uniform, the only recognizable bits being medals from the war against Bukharin. The old man took a deep breath before his rasp sounded over the downpour. What has happened to our defenders, our brothers, our fathers, our sons? The old veteran cried out. They're defeated in a skirmish, the sergeant replied, his grin dissipating into a frown as he made the connection. You and your people are now under the protection of the Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army. You have nothing to fear. The old man gave a pensive look before hobbling off the road. The sergeant ordered his march continued. Then the old man behind, a streak of lightning lit up the street before a clap of thunder roared across the sky and the torrent of rain grew heavier. The droplets concealed their tears. But we're going to end today's episode there. We are really making sure that Ukraine really has a fun little civil war, don't we? At least ideologically speaking. Hey, socialism is here too. If you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. As will probably explode. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.